we're coming to you live from Sync Summit 2015 at Club V in Santa Monica. We managed to catch up with Jessica Sabraj from Rumblefish. Right. Jessica, thank you so much for joining us. So happy to be here. Um, tell me about Rumblefish. I, I mean, I'm asking because Rumblefish is a very unique kind of situation. Sure. It's distinct from other kinds of music licensing companies in the marketplace. So can you tell us about it? Yeah, I think Rumblefish is actually radically different and in a good way. So we just talked in our panel about some of the differences in platforms about retitling and exclusivity and fair rates. And I think Rumblefish, of everyone on the market, is actually the fairest company. We, we don't retitle, we don't believe in it. We're non-exclusive, so our artists can still shop their music however, wherever they'd like to. And our rates are pretty decent, they're, they're up to par with the market. I think the thing that sets us really apart is the fact that we're the leaders in micro-licensing, which not that many people know of or even do. Explain what micro-licensing sure. is. So a micro-license is basically a sync license that is paired with any UGC video. So anytime anyone creates a video of their cat or like a surf video, there's a license they have to, um, they have to do if they're going to use music. So uh, it goes across YouTube, Vimeo, Dailymotion, GoPro, any of those major UGC networks is where Rumblefish will provide a micro license to. Okay, and people just come directly to you for that license to, to use for the music? They can, so um, we had a service called Friendly Music where people could come and get their licenses automatically. It was all just downloadable, ready to go. Now we're actually working directly with some of these networks, so you can be using your phone or even be in like the YouTube store or the Vimeo store and purchase a license directly from there. And a lot of the content that's supplied comes directly from us. Okay. As a company, I mean, you know, in terms of coming out in a marketplace that's, you know, fairly, I guess, crowded, especially over the last 10 years, mm -hmm. what have been the greatest challenges that you guys uh, as a company have faced? I think that's exactly it. It's, it's the overcrowding and the saturation of our market here in the U.S. Um, I feel like every day I'm coming across a new library or you know, a, a, new, a new syndicate of pitchers that are pitching the same stuff over and over and over. For us, we've been able to excel because I think we're very client orientated. Mm -hmm. I personally like to talk to all of our clients. I like to figure out exactly what they're, they're looking for. I try to anticipate their needs. I don't ever overcrowd them and just send them a bunch of stuff. I think that's the most annoying thing in the world when you're, you know, you're working on like a hip hop TV show, but all of a sudden you're getting nothing but orchestral and jazz and pop. And it's like, you, I didn't ask for that. Please don't send me that. Um, so we try to just excel at meeting the client expectations and not focus so much on on all the noise and the crowd. We just want to be the best at what we do. And I think we are. In terms of your clientele, how, well not how, but what are you finding uh, as, as someone who's on the front lines? What are you finding are the choices or the styles that are most requested now for the kinds of clients that you're working sure. for? Sure, it's so varied. Um, so I head up all the traditional TV, film, advertising, and gaming. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's a single genre that's requested the most. It really depends on the project. Okay. Um, so right now we've gotten a lot of requests for some country, for some things that we're working on in, in different TV shows in that genre. Um, my biggest project that I'm working on right now is for a major mobile company in Brazil where they want, oddly enough, European pop and rock. So, yeah. So every day, I, th I think that's the thing that I love about this job though, is that every day is so different and I never know what's going to come across the table. Um, for sure, some things haven't changed in our industry. Like the number one way that people still ask for music is by using a reference track. So a lot of the time we get requests from supervisors and from editors saying, hey, I really want this Beyonce track, but I can't afford it. Can you help me replace it? And that's, I think, how maybe 90% of people look for music right now. Interesting. Yeah. OK. From, from uh, your experience, what would you say are the types of clients beyond film, beyond television, and video games, which you said are the main ones you deal with, but beyond that, what are the main types of clients that you guys deal with outside of those three realms? It's the micro-licensing UGC stuff. So we do okay. about 100,000 licenses like that a day. A day, yeah. And oh everyone makes that face too. It's like, oh. That's, that seems like a staggering <laughs> sum of, of licenses. It's staggering. Um, when I joined the company, 
that I think that's the thing that blew me away the most. I always knew that Rumblefish was fantastic and phenomenal at licensing, but I hadn't really realized the depth or really the, the size of the opportunity of the micro licensing market until I joined the company and they said, yeah, we do 100,000 sinks a day. We've done 65 million to date, which is insane. But that's how big this opportunity is. And I think that's where a lot of artists probably aren't aren't getting income from yet because maybe they don't understand it and hopefully through doing things like Sync Summit and doing things like this we can help encourage these artists to get on Rumblefish and to, to tackle some of that income that they're probably missing. Yeah, no, I would say yeah. so because it's such a new kind of thing uh, yeah. for artists to educate themselves on. Let me ask you a business question. From, from your experience, what are the ways or I guess formulas, how do you charge for music? Is it dependent on the usage, the length? What, 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 sure. what are the, the determining factors here? Um, definitely it depends on the usage, what kind of media it's going to be. TV fees are generally a lot lower than maybe a film fee, significantly lower than an advertising fee. Gaming can be on the same level as TV. And then within each of those mediums, there are different things that affect uh, the pricing, like how long the music will be used for, mm -hmm. um, what territories will it be shown in, um, even sometimes how many copies of it is, is actually going to be sold. So in most cases, I think nowadays people like to do all, all media in perpetuity because that kind of covers all their bases and they don't have to come back to us to license. It can be really annoying if you license a piece of music for maybe like two years and then realize, uh-oh, my TV show's now picked up, it's syndicated, I've got to go back and do all those licenses again. If you're dealing with you know, a nice agent, they'll, they'll cut you a fair deal. If you're dealing with somebody who's not nice, they might price gouge you a little bit, which is not cool, but it happens. Um, micro licensing, we kind of have set those fees and I think we're now the standard for that. It can range from you know a few bucks to up to a couple hundred depending on what the usage is. I think too that for reps when we're dealing with clients we, we want to be flexible because that's the way that you retain more clients, that's the way you keep them coming back. So sometimes I, you know, we may want to cut a little bit of a deal for a client that we know is having a, a tough time if they're going to come back and do their next like 10 syncs with us. Right. Yeah, so we try to just be flexible and be nice, reasonable guys, but at the end of the day, we want to make sure our artists are paid. That's the most important thing. You've got to pay your artists. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm curious from your experience in terms of licensing, are you finding that more and more people in the licensing request side coming to you are wanting to license things for internet only? Like, I see a lot mm -hmm. of brands, they don't put these ads on TV, but they do put them yeah. on the internet only. Do you find and is that a specific kind of cost as distinct from television or motion picture? Completely. Okay. It is. So even now, there are more and more digital only ad agencies popping up. So there are these agencies that will only do digital advertisements for YouTube or Facebook or Vimeo. Um, and there are there is pricing that's different for that. It can range from a couple hundred bucks up to a few thousand, depending on what the brand is and also to what their budget is. Um, it's funny. Here in the U.S., we're very transparent about what budgets are. It's, it's a, definitely a two-way conversation. I could talk to you and say, hey, what's your budget? You know, let me know what you're working with, and we can work something in that range. Internationally, it's not like that at all. Internationally, if you ask somebody what their budget is, they may not be able to tell you, or they just, they, they just want to know what your price is first, and then they'll be able to work with that or just walk away completely. I'm much more preferential to a two-way conversation about pricing, though, because I think that's how we get to a happy medium and we make sure everybody is paid. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for doing this. I oh, really no problem. It. Yeah, it was Thank so you. much fun. All right. You got it. Thanks again. Thanks.